So good morning and uh, welcome to the first and hopefully a series of undergraduate lectures we're calling uh, Economics in Everyday Life. The purpose of this lecture series is to uh, enrich the undergraduate economics experience and to show you that economics isn't just about supply and demand and marginal cost and marginal benefit, but economics is more, uh, more of a tool and a way to view everyday interaction in all sorts of interactions in the world. And today we're very fortunate to have one of, uh, we think, the world's best institutional economists, uh, not from very far away, Professor Doug Allen from Simon Fraser. And he's going to talk to us about something that you never would have thought involved economics, but it'll turn out to be exactly that, the economics of dueling. Thank you very much, Scott. Uh, thanks for coming out. I, uh, I hope most of you aren't here just under duress uh, by your professor, but uh, I appreciate you coming out. The last time I gave a talk at Calgary in the wintertime was 25 years ago, and uh, halfway through my talk, the fire alarm went off, and I had to go stand outside without a coat for 20 minutes. So if it's the talk's halfway through and you're not very happy, you can leave, but just don't pull the fire alarm like the last time. So. Uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about something that is really bizarre and probably the most bizarre kind of behavior that you can imagine, and that's this practice of dueling. And the purpose is going to be to show that the economic way of thinking is actually very powerful and can give us a, an insight into what actually happens. And in an insight in a way that other social scientists uh, at least can't or have not done. So. I'm going to talk about a group of people that you've probably heard that name before, aristocrats. And I'm going to talk about a practice that they've got or had, namely dueling. So just a little bit of shameless self-promotion. I'm going to be talking about basically chapter four of this book that I wrote. Uh, and I only, I only actually put this slide up here because I just want to indicate this first word in the subtitle called measurement. So well, I want you to think about an age uh, between 1500 and 1900. And what characterized this time period was a really difficult ability to measure. It was a world where they couldn't do things that you take absolutely for granted. Like what time is it? People had a very hard time knowing what time it was. Where am I? What's my location? Uh, had a very hard time figuring that out. It was a time when nature played a huge role in life. And as a result, people had a very hard time measuring and monitoring performance. And this was something that's characterized the world. And I'm going to argue that our, the aristocracy and dueling was a way of solving a problem in a world where it's very difficult to know what's going on. So what do these people have in common? There is, uh, there's George Washington. OK, if you don't laugh at that joke, we're in trouble, OK? <laughs> so that's actually Abraham Lincoln. Uh, there is a man named uh, uh, Andrew Jackson, name just escapes me, another president of the United States. There's a fellow named Arthur Wellesley. He was the first Duke of Wellington. There's a man named John Churchill, son of Winston Churchill, the person after whom the town of Churchill, Manitoba is named, and the Churchill River. Uh, that character, here's a guy that you will recognize. His name is Aaron Burr. He was the vice president of the United States under Thomas Jefferson. And this is a man named Alexander Hamilton. He was first secretary of the treasury under George Washington. He was a founding father of the United States. He certainly would have been a, uh, a future president of the United States had he not died. And this last person, well, Lanny McDonald. But, uh, what do these people have in common? I'm not sure about Lanny McDonald, but uh, uh, they have three things in common. The first thing that they have in common is that all of them were born into families that were at the bottom end of the ruling class. So they were born into families that were uh, part, if you will, we'll call them the gentry. They were educated families, wealthy families, but only wealthy with respect to the rest of the population. Among the ruling class, they were definitely at the bottom. Now, the second thing they have in common is that they all rose to the absolute pinnacle of power and authority 
in their time and place. Either presidents of the United States, dukes, commanders of the army, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so they were all born at the bottom, but they all rose to the top. And the other thing they had in common is that they all dueled. And that if you were to go back in this time period and look at people that were born at the bottom of the ruling class and work their way up, that would be a common feature. They all engaged in this practice of dueling, of dueling. And those particular people all had very famous duels. We know a lot about them, some of them infamous duels. Now, maybe you don't know anything about dueling, so I'll give you a little background. Uh, just about everything you do know about dueling is probably wrong because everything we know about dueling comes from movies. And uh, there's no way a movie could actually portray an actual duel because a modern person would say, that's impossible. Nobody would have done that. It's just such a bizarre institution that the movies have to make it, they have to add a bunch of modern features, otherwise nobody would actually believe it. But there actually were three types of duels. And two of the duels took place in medieval times, feudal times, and I'm not going to talk about them, but I just want to contrast them a little bit. The first duel is what's called a judicial duel or a trial by combat. This is where Scott has accused me of stealing his chicken, and uh, there's not really enough evidence that I stole his chicken, and uh, so what we've decided is we're going to have a fight, and uh, the winner of this fight is the person who's righteous and God has chosen and said, that's the innocent party. And so if Scott and I have a fight and I win, I obviously did not steal his chicken and he's a liar and then we're gonna chop his hand off or do something like that. But that was a, a judicial trial. It was a medieval thing. Of all things, it stays on the books in England until the 19th century. So it's there until the 19th century. But look what's going on here. So here we have our two combatants. Notice they're dressed in armor. There could have been a host of weapons, all different kinds of weapons, but they've got shields, daggers, they've got some lances here. But notice what else is going on. It's a very public affair. There's the lords in the background here. There's other people watching. Uh, it would have been a very public thing. The state would have sanctioned this. The church would have sanctioned this. Totally legitimate. We're not going to be worried about this kind of duel. The other kind of duel is uh, what you might see is in the movie is a chivalrous duel. This is where knights get together and they have battles and they have sword fights and they joust like this with horses. And this would have been part of a pageant. It would have been a festival. And this would have maybe been the, the key thing. It would have been entertainment, a contest. And again, it would have been held in very public affair, kind of like the Olympic Games of the 14th century. Uh, you've got uh, lords and ladies up here, other people watching. Again, a whole host of weapons. Uh, people are unlikely to be killed here, lots of defensive weapons, etc. This is pretty much done by 1500. Uh, you know, it's gone with feudalism. So we're going to be talking about a different duel, though, the duel of honor, the duel of honor. And so here's some pictures. This is a painting. Notice the difference in this picture compared to the other ones. There is a bunch of trees in the background. The reason why there's trees in the background is because this is being held in secret. It's not a public event. In fact, this duel is illegal. Even though it's illegal, these guys are going to be announcing that, they're du that they have dueled and they won't be arrested. All right? But it is illegal. It's held in private. Notice there's no defensive weapons. These guys are just dressed in their clothing. They've got a, a sword here. It's a, initially, it was a rapier, a very stiff weapon evolves into an epee. Another very stiff weapon designed for stabbing. Very lethal weapon. Uh, but no defensive weapons. There's a few people in the background here. Each one of these combatants would have brought a friend to the, to the duel. That friend was called a second. And that second would have been the person who organized the duel, made sure the weapons were OK, made sure the reasons were fine. Uh, they're the ones who are going to be going out announcing that the duel actually took place. There's a, there might be a referee to tell them when to start, when to stop, when it's over. And there's probably a surgeon here, a surgeon to you know, minister to the person who's, who's going to be injured or dead. Sword duels evolve into saber duels by the in, end of the 18th century. A saber, a saber is a curved weapon. It's for slashing. It's not for stabbing. 
And as a slashing weapon, it's actually very, it, it mutilates people a lot. But it generally is much less lethal. You're much more likely to die from an infection from the slash than the slash itself. So you'll be scarred up, but it's a slashing weapon. Now what's interesting about this picture is this isn't actually, a, it's a photograph. So this is a photograph of a duel that's taking place at the end of the 19th century, which is very late in the dueling times. This guy's obviously one. Here's this guy here. That's actually his head. <laughs> so this guy was actually decapitated. So I'm pretty sure you know this was a lethal duel. But what I also like about this duel, notice this picture, it's, it's obviously taking place in private. There's a few people here, seconds and everything. And here's the referee. And he's got his hand up like, OK, OK, I think it's over. Right? That, uh, get up, get up. <laughs> so uh, that's a saber duel. All these sword duels, though, they mostly, by the middle of the 18th century and well into the 19th century, they, they morph into or they evolve into the duels that we're more familiar with. And that's a pistol duel, a pistol duel. So again, held in private. There's seconds around. There's a surgeon. Here they go. This is a painting. What's unlikely in this painting is, is that these guys are clothed. So it's mostly common in a pistol duel to strip down to the waist or even to strip completely naked. Uh, because again, you're more likely to die from infection from a thread entering the wound than the wound itself. And so they would often strip down and uh, often demonstrate that they're not hiding anything or doing something like that. So uh, this is the kind of duel that we're interested in. Now, let me just give you some of the characteristics of these duels to sort of get at how, how bizarre they are. The first thing, what caused a duel? Answer, almost anything. Almost anything. I had coffee this morning, and uh, I walked into the coffee room, and my friend Curtis Eaton was there, and he did this. He turned his back to me. He was cool towards me. That's it, Curtis. Tomorrow, pistols at dawn. Right? You can't be cool towards me. We're, we're going we're gonna to put our lives on the line tomorrow, and one of us is going to be dead because you didn't say hello or good morning. Right? If, 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 I'm in an, if I'm in an environment and somebody touched me, they, they pushed me. Or maybe they touched my face. You tripped me earlier. I don't think I didn't notice that. <laughs> they, uh, uh, you, if you touched me, you touched my face in particular. You took your glove and slapped my face. Or if you pulled my nose, automatic grounds for a duel. And if I do not challenge you to a duel, that's going to be the equivalent of me not dueling at all. So I, I, you know, it's just automatically grounds. If there's any hint, insinuation that I'm not telling the truth. Yeah, I went to this lecture on dueling, and he, he said something. He gave a date, and it wasn't right. <laughs> duel, OK? I, 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 and you can't suggest that I'm not telling the truth. But there are just a whole host of dozens and dozens and dozens of, of offenses. And all the offenses are trivial. Now, just stop and think about that. A trivial offense, and you're going to put your life on the line. That's why a lot of people look at dueling and they say, if ever there was an example of irrational behavior, crazy behavior, just male aggression gone, you know, testosterone just gone crazy, it's got to be uh, dueling. Now, here's the next bizarre thing. OK, so there are some offense. We actually entered into a duel, and it doesn't matter who wins. Who cares, right? It doesn't matter. You win, you lose, it doesn't matter. Just uh, your social standing. Let's just go back to work. You know, we'll just uh, carry on our day as if nothing happened. I mean, what? Right? I mean, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, it's regulated by a really strict set of rules. So you don't want to think of dueling as a bar fight or something like that where anything goes. No, there is a very strict set of rules. The only time you get in trouble when you duel is if you do not follow the rules. And so there are very strict set of rules that have to be followed. It's a highly ritualized, highly designed activity. And it's going to have a purpose. Always held in private. It's always nominally illegal. If the right people were dueling, if the likes of Abraham Lincoln and Andrew Jackson, if they're dueling, no problem. Okay? And if for un some unimaginable reason, if they ever were arrested, they're not going to get prosecuted. And I mean, nothing's going to happen to them. However, if Farmer Joe decides to duel, uh, he's going to be arrested for a murder or attempted murder. Okay, so it's nominally illegal, but for those who it was designed for, no problem. Here's another bizarre thing. Curtis was cool towards me. 
right? I challenge him to a duel. We shoot each other, and or maybe I shoot him. I'm better shot than he is. But uh, and then, as he in his dying words, he pulls out a letter of apology, and he says, "You know, I'm sorry. I, sh I you know, I, I should have said hello to you yesterday. <laughs> you, you know, you're my, you know, and we we would share how much we loved one another and worked on our book together and all this kind of stuff. I mean, wouldn't it make some sense? Hello, shouldn't you have produced that before the duel? You're going to apologize anyway. Why wouldn't you say it ahead of time? Why did you wait? And yet they always waited. They always waited. Now, does that not seem kind of strange and weird? No defensive weapons allowed. It is all about attacking. All about attacking. A duel was usually a swift event. These guys weren't fighting for days. You know, an epee duel lasts maybe, you know, two or three minutes and somebody's lying dead on the ground, right? Pistol duel, same thing. You've got two or three shots being fired quickly, end of story. Lethalness is falling through time. I don't know if we'll, we'll get to that, but lethalness is mostly falling through the rules and the choice of weapons. It begins in 1500, what I call the beginning of the pre-modern era, the end of feudalism, the beginning of this pre-modern era, begins with the likes of Henry VIII, that kind of a king, the first pre-modern king, and it ends in, depending where you are, pretty much ends in the middle of the 19th century. If we're gonna focus on, on England, it ends with Queen Victoria. It lingers on in the 19th century, really till World War I, but it's really just fencing by that time. And really it's, not, it's nothing like what it was during this period. And here's the key. It's the sole domain of the ruling aristocracy. And really, it's the sole domain of a subset of the aristocracy. It's meant for a certain group of people. Anybody else is in trouble if they do it. If these guys do it, there's no big deal, but it is their sole domain until the very end. <coughs> now, you cannot understand dueling unless you understand something about these aristocrats themselves, who they were, why they were, etc. So these are a group of people that, that live during the same time period, 1500, Henry VIII, all the way up to Victoria. They live for about 350, 400 years there, they're in charge. Now you know there's always been princes and dukes and, and lords and ladies and things like that, but their function was often different. So prior to 1500, the, the lords were, they were uh, really soldiers, right? So William the Conqueror comes over in 1066, he basically takes 30 of his family members and he sets them up as magnets, lords of the realm, right? They're almost like little sub-kings and they're very powerful. They have, they have massive amounts of land, castles. They have their own army. They're really rivals to the king in a lot of ways. These guys are not them. These guys are bureaucrats. They're administers, administrators. And they're not like a modern aristocrat either who is just really an aristocrat in name only. These guys had offices and power. So these guys did not live in a castle. They lived in a country home. They had no direct military powers. Individually, their land holdings were, were nothing compared to the earlier lords. They were much smaller, much less wealth. But collectively, there was a lot more of them. So William the Conqueror, he set up about 30 lords. By the time Henry VIII comes along, there's only 40 of them, 40 families. Within 100 years, there'll be 300 of them. So, uh, you know, they sort of stay at around 300 to 400 throughout this period. Uh, so it's a small number, but it's big compared to the feudal times. And collectively, they're pretty powerful. If you know anything about English history, collectively, a group of them chop off the head of Charles I, right? So it's not like they're, even though each individually they're small, collectively they're, they're quite powerful. They are 100% completely engaged in running the government, in running the show. There is no area of civil administration that they are not responsible for. They are the judges. They are the justice of the peace. They are the sheriffs. They are the, uh, the officers in the army, the officers in the navy. They control the church. They control the universities. They control the executive arm of the, of the king. Uh, everything they control. There's nobody that's halfway. Nobody's got a business on the side and is uh, chancellor of the exchequer. Uh, that's, not, that's not what's going on. They had a very strict and complicated social code of conduct of which dueling was part of it. And here's an interesting thing. At the end of this era, at the turn of the 20th century, they effectively voluntarily stepped back. 
and they sell out and they become essentially aristocrats in name only. They start in 1500 when England is just a nothing fringe country. And when they're finished in 1900, England rules the world. So whatever they did, as bizarre their behavior was, it was, it was uh, probably for a good reason. So here they are. They, these are these people. We can think of them as this kind of a, a pyramid kind of thing. At the top, you've got a very small class of people, tiny in number, never more than this 300 people. At the top, you've got the duke, right? You've got marquises and earls and viscounts and barons. Very small, very rigid, very hard to get into this class of people. Uh, at the bottom, you've got what are called the gentry. And this gentry are made up of the, some titled folks like baronetcies, uh, knights, but it's mostly made up of people that are calling themselves esquires and gentlemen. These are feudal titles that really don't have any formal meaning in this time period, but uh, you know these are part of the landed class called the gentry. People from this group, younger sons and daughters, are constantly moving into this group. Some of them are moving out into being commoners. Some commoners are moving into this group. So this group down here is, there's about 15,000, 20,000 of these people during this time period as compared to 300 of these. This gentry, I'm going to argue in a minute, these are the people that are dueling. They are at the bottom of this ruling class. That's where Abraham Lincoln's born. That's where John Churchill is born. They're born down into here, and they're going to work their way up into here, and they're going to get there by dueling. Okay, So much less wealth. Compared to the rest of society, these people down here are extremely wealthy. Right? They're in the top 5% of the income distribution, but it's just nothing like this group up here. Now, why did these people exist? Well, again, now i got to go back and just sort of briefly summarize. King lives in a time period where he can't run the country by himself. He needs administrators. Henry VIII is at a point in history where the world has suddenly you know, exploded in size. They've discovered North America. They've discovered the Far East. They're developing trade routes. He's got an administration, though tiny by our standards, needs administrators, right? And yet he can't monitor them. He can't measure them. He doesn't know what they're doing. He needs to trust them. And so they developed a system which included what was called patronage. And patronage is where I give you, I'm king, I give you an office. I say, you are now admiral of my fleet. And as admiral of my fleet, you are going to make a fortune as the admiral. And I am going to trust you that you will act on my interests and on my behalf. Why would I trust you? Well, the king is going to trust his appointment because we're going to design a system where if you, get, if you cheat and get caught or there's some bad outcome, I'm going to be able to punish you by more than what you would benefit. So you have an incentive not to cheat. And we'll look at it for two types of people. Two types of people. One, people who are already wealthy. So there are people around that were already wealthy, and they might have said, I would like to be me. I'd like to be admiral of the fleet. I'd like to be, uh, you know, uh, port commissioner. I would like to be own a post office in London. Me, me, me. I've got lots of wealth. That's one type of person that's going to be an aristocrat. The other type of person is going to be like you. You, you don't have any uh, wealth in, at hand, but uh, you're like John Churchill. You've got a lot of time on your hands, and you're like me, me. I, I want to be, I want to be colonel too, and we're going to have a different system for you. So let's go through the wealthy one first, and the uh, the the young person second. A person of wealth. So I've got wealth, and the king is looking for somebody to be a postmaster, chancellor of the exchequer, or something like that. What I am going to do is I'm going to take my wealth, my gold, and I'm going to invest it in a sunk asset. Now, most of our econ majors, you know what a sunk good is. A sunk, sunk asset is something that once invested, I can't get it back. It's like taking all of my money and lighting it on fire. And so the only way I'm going to be able to recoup that crazy thing I'm doing is by being involved with the king over and over again, being honest with him, legitimate with him, being his admiral, making a fortune all that time. If I get caught cheating, I'm going to be ousted from the group, and I'll never get the money back that I invested in this sunk asset. That's sort of how the system worked. And I'm going to invest in things that are very visible 
so the king knows that I invested. Number one thing I'm going to build, or I'm going to have, I'm going to buy an estate, and I'm going to build one of these. I'm going to build one of these. If you've traveled around England or Europe, you see these massive palaces. They are in the middle of nowhere. Okay, Even today, they're in the middle of nowhere. They don't even have a village close by. What is this? You know, the family would live in just a little section of this thing, this house, this palace. What this effectively was, was a hotel. And it was a hotel for other people to come at who never paid anything for a room's night stay. And they might stay for months and months and months. And I'd have to entertain them, take them out on fox hunts, and uh, feed them and all the rest of it. It was very expensive to build, very expensive to maintain. Imagine the number of people required to run that thing. And here's the thing. They could not sell it. They entered into a type of legal contract that prevented them from reselling it. So it's a sunk cost. I'm going to build this incredible home in the middle of nowhere, and it's a sunk cost. I cannot recoup my investment by reselling that house. Not only that, I'm going to have like five or 10,000 acres that was previously used for farming. I'm going to take it, and I'm going to destroy it. I'm going to put in a big lake. I'm going to plant a forest. They called it a park. And I'm going to build uh, Greek monuments and temples and all that kind of stuff. And there's no way you can farm this stuff. And so I'm going to make, there's not going to be any income being coming from this land. It's another sunk investment that I'm going to make. All right, so I'm going to take it out of production. And then I'm going to say, okay, fox hunt at my house for the next 12 days. You know, 50, 60 families can come stay in my hotel. I'll feed you, everything like that. I'm going to have picnics. We'll have parties. Uh, we'll have all these kinds of things. I'm going to build the church for the closest village. I'm going to pay the parson. I'm going to actually probably build a village even for people. Uh, I'm going to, you know, we'll have a Boxing Day celebration after Christmas where I'll give everybody presents and all these kinds of things. I'm going to engage in what they call port. I'm going to be throwing money away left, right, and center, right? And there's no way I get that money back. It's a sunk cost. So these were invisible investments that were sunk. And so the idea is, I'm working for the king. If I cheat him in some minor way that I don't get my head cut off, but I just, you know, there's some incident that happened, he doesn't trust me anymore, what do I do? I have to go live in this castle, not a castle, this palace, in the middle of nowhere, where nobody now comes to visit me. I'm just alone. I can't, I, what can I do? I can't farm the land. I basically, I've got nothing. I'm a social outcast in this place that I built. That's how the system worked. For aristocrats. So who were the aristocrats? They were this group of people that invested in this conspicuous consumption so that the king could trust them. And the incredible thing is, the more they invested, the more they could be trusted, the more money they made in these offices that the king gave them. And they amassed fortunes that you know would boggle our mind today. Right? So it was a system that worked really well. Now, it had one problem, though. Here it is, it's 1500, you're Henry VIII, you've got 40 of these guys around, but you need 300. And so you look around and you say, who out there has a lot of money and might be interested in doing this kind of thing? And maybe there's a dozen people. There aren't enough of them. But I need like 300 administrators. What am I going to do? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a different system. I'm going to still, it's going to work the same way. You're going to have to invest in sunk assets, but it's something that you have at your disposal. So let's go back here. Here's the young John Churchill. Let me tell you a little bit about him. So his father is named Winston Churchill. His father lives on 10 acres. He's a, about as minor a gentry person as you can get, but he's, he's related. He's got a connection with Charles I. Charles I gets involved in the English Revolution. He gets his head copped off, and Winston finds himself on the losing side. But he's such a minor player. When Oliver Cromwell comes to power, he says, you know what? You are now banished to your estate. Right? I can't trust you. You're banished to your estate. Go live for, on 10 acres. Can you imagine trying to live on 10 acres in the 17th century? I mean, John, John Churchill grows up very poor. He's a member of this gentry class, but he, he's pretty poor. In 1660, when Charles II gets restored to the crown, he looks at people who are loyal to his father, and he says, I'm going to hand out some patronage. I'm going to give people some various offices. And he eventually gets down to Winston Churchill, who is too old now for an office, but he's got a son who's like 14 years old. And he says, okay, you will be a page 
in the house of my brother, the Duke of York. A page is like a, a servant uh, to, the, to, the, to the Duke. The Duke will be the future King of England, James II. And that's what he takes. That's what he takes. Now, this young man, John Churchill, is extremely ambitious. He knows he's at the bottom of that gentry pool and he desperately wants to get at the top. He's also extremely talented. He's going to be one of the greatest military leaders in history. His exploits will rank up with Alexander the Great and Napoleon and everybody else. He is going to actually, in the future, he is going to establish England as a powerhouse uh, in military battles. Yet that's all in the future. And this is a time period where merit doesn't count because you can't measure performance. And so what's he going to do? He doesn't have any income to buy an estate and build a seat and all that kind of stuff. What's he going to do? Well, what he does is what other people in his position do. He's got time. And he's going to take that time and he's going to invest in what economists call social capital. He's going to take that time and he's going to invest it in activities that are also sunk and are completely useless on the surface. He's going to go to school. He's not going to learn economics. He's going to learn Latin. What's the purpose of learning Latin and Greek? Right? No purpose at all. Right? It's just literally he's going to demonstrate that he wasted his time. Right? He's, apologies to lovers of Latin, but I doubt there are many here. He's going to invest in incredible social skills. He's going to learn how to do a whole bunch of complicated dances. Not dances like we do where anybody gets up there and does this. No, he's going to have you know, intricate moves that are going to take lots of time to learn. right? And he's going to learn how to play the harpsichord and the piano. He wants to be a general. But you know, he's going to learn how to play the piano, just so that he can prove to people that I wasted a lot of time learning how to play the piano. I bet some of you can relate to that. Right? He's going he's to marry only certain types of people. right? Not love interests. No fire alarm, OK? Just, uh, he's uh, he's, he's going to marry into a certain class. So he's going to take his time, and he's going to devote it into these activities. Other people are going to recognize that time and realize that it's sunk. Suppose the king recognizes that, and he says, okay, I'm going to trust you, and you're going to be one of my servants, and if you screw up, you're a social outcast, you're kicked out, and all that time in Latin, all that time with those dance steps is useless because nobody will ever dance with you again, right? And your Latin is a completely wasted skill, and you are going to, all, the, all that investment you made, you have no chance to recoup, and that's why I'm going to trust you. Now, I'll give you one example. I don't know how many people have read or seen a movie, Pride and Prejudice? A few of you. OK. We still watch it because it's a modern love story, but it's written at the end of the 18th century by Jane Austen. And she's so careful in looking around and seeing the particular behaviors. It's the story of five sisters. Well, here's Elizabeth, and here's Jane, and you don't see the other younger ones. Five sisters of the Mr. Bennet. They are about as marginal a gentry family as you can get. They have a they have a history of, of being gentlemen, but they're at the very bottom end of the, that, that pyramid. Okay? They're in the class, but at the bottom. They're desperately seeking to marry well and to move up into inner circles. But it's called pride and prejudice. They have a pride in the fact that they're gentry, but they experience a lot of prejudice from those above them who say, you know, you're not good enough. And the story revolves around Elizabeth, who eventually falls in love with the Mr. Darcy, Mr. Darcy's a very wealthy young man. He's the nephew of a duke. The duke has passed away, so he's the, who's left is the dowager, his, his aunt, Lady Catherine. And Lady Catherine is not happy that Mr. Darcy, future duke himself, is going to be interested in Lady Elizabeth. Now, just two scenes. When Elizabeth meets Lady Catherine for the first time, Lady Catherine has no idea that she's interested or Darcy's interested in her. And the very first thing that Lady Catherine says, so can you imagine you go and meet somebody, some, some person, you met them, and the very first thing she says is, okay, go play the piano. Come on, go, 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 go play, go play. And Elizabeth is very polite and says, oh, you know, I don't want to play the piano. Go and play the piano. What is Lady Catherine saying to Elizabeth? You know, I want to see how much time you've wasted. I want to see how much, how good you are. Because if you can't play the piano, I can't trust you because you have not demonstrated, you have not invested in any social capital. I can't trust you, get out, right? But of course it turns out she has invested, she's a great piano player. 
Later in the story, Lady Catherine realizes that uh, Elizabeth and Darcy, Darcy has fallen in love with Elizabeth. And Darcy is thinking about proposing. This is a nightmare for Lady Catherine. So in the middle of the night, she gets her carriage with her 12 horses and she races off to the Bennett family home. And it's the middle of the night. She pounds on the door. She wakes them up. They're all in their piano, pajamas. And not their pianos, but uh, <laughs> only the Dukes wore poor pianos. But uh, the, uh, they're in their pajamas. And what's the first words out of her mouth? The first words out of her mouth are, you, sir, have a very small park. Think about that. She's saying, you have only six rhododendrons. Right? Why? What is she talking about? What she's saying is, you you call yourself a gentry? You call yourself an aristocrat? You think I can trust you? You've only got two acres of, of parkland. Nobody can be trusted with just, you have not invested enough in a sunk asset, and therefore you cannot be trusted. And therefore, there's no way your daughter is going to be marrying Mr. Darcy. Right? The whole book is laced with this kind of stuff that when we look back at it, we just say, wow, that's weird. That's weird. The whole book is they're concerned about, you know, Mr. Darcy came to the dance, and he didn't dance. Oh my goodness, you know, they talk about it for days and weeks afterwards, you know? And Darcy's family's concerned because Elizabeth has an uncle who is, gasp, a lawyer. You know, oh my goodness, what shame, <laughs> you know, what? I mean, I mean, we don't like lawyers today, but I mean, the aristocrat, you, you can't have a lawyer in the family, how vulgar. But again, what's going on there is that the, uh, the aristocrats are looking at this family and saying, can we trust them? Have they invested enough in the social capital to be trusted? All right, well, how does it work? I've already said, you know, if, if, you, if uh, you know, it's lost, if you get kicked out of society. So that's what's going to give the, the, the young man, the, the young man an incentive to be honest and behave. But here's the problem. Here's the problem. Even though you might be able to observe somebody initial level of social capital, you're born in a gutter, you got nothing. You're born a son of a duke, okay, you've got some social capital right off the bat. We can maybe figure out where you are in the distribution, but I can't really tell about your investments. I can't really tell how, you know, did you really learn Latin? Did you go to, the, did you go to the, uh, the, the party and did you actually make some friendships? You know, I can't really observe that. And I also can't observe if you're maintaining your social capital. Are you, are you remembering how to play the piano? I mean, are you keeping it up? Right? Are you doing that kind of thing? So that's a problem. I, I, the king needs these people. He needs them to invest in social capital, but he can't tell if they've invested. With the big aristocrats, I can tell, okay, I see your palace, I see your park, I can see it. But with the social capital, I can't see it. And so we need a solution. And that's what the duel was. The duel was a test, a screen, to see if you actually invested in this capital. It was designed, again, it's a highly ritualized thing. It's not a bar fight. It has a whole set of rules. It's designed so that, on, on, well, on two things here. So it's based on the probability of death. We're going to play around with the probability of death and dying with a duel. And we're going to play around with how much social capital you need. And we're going to play around with how costly it is to get that social capital. If you accept the duel, then we're going to say, well, it's a screen. You pass the test and you're allowed to be in society. If you reject the duel, well, then you failed the test and you're kicked out. That's the way a screen works, right? It's just a test, just a test. Here's uh, Samuel Johnson. He was a literary figure in the 18th century in London. He says this, he says, in a state of highly polished society, an affront, touching my face, etc., is held to be serious. It must therefore be resented or rather a duel must be fought upon it, as men have agreed to banish from their society one who puts up with an affront without fighting a duel. Curtis was cool to me. Everybody saw he was cool to me. I did not challenge him to a duel. I'm out. Out. Nobody's going to talk to you again. You think that was cold. People are going to be really cold now, right? Uh, or I challenge Curtis to a duel. He says, no, out. Curtis, no more of the lecture. You're gone. History. You can't, nobody, and nobody's allowed to talk to him. Right? And he's completely banished from society. Now, I said it was designed, and uh, I'll just give you a, a hint at how the design worked. So remember, you can't observe the duel. I'm sorry, you can't in observe the social capital investment. So that means there are going to be people around that are pretenders. 
They're going to be fakers around, people that are going to suggest that they're an investor, but they're really not. Mr. Wickham is a character in the Pride and Prejudice book. He's the, he's the evil, terrible person. He's definitely a pretender. He's pretending he's one of these aristocrats when, in fact, he's, he's, a, he's, an, he's a bad man, right? Well, let's just think about the probability of death. I can't make the probability of death in a duel too low. I can't make it zero, for example. If you're going to duel and never die, well, then the likes of Mr. Wickham, the pretenders, are always going to say, hey, what the heck? I'll give it a try, right? Uh, you know, I'm not going to die anyway, so I'll do. So if you make the probability of death too low, everybody duels, and the duel's not a test. So that's no good. Secondly, there are real investors out there. And I can't make the, the probability of death too high, because if I make it too high, even the legitimate investors are going to say, whew, the probability of, of it dying is one. Even though I'm, I'm a trustworthy type, I'm not going to duel. So nobody duels, and then that's no good. So there's going to be a window. There's going to be a window for this probability of death, right? That, that where the one type agree and the other type don't agree. Also, you're not going to want to make the cost of acquiring social capital and the level of social capital, you're not going to want to make it so high that nobody in that marginal gentry class wants to invest. Right? So you're going to have to design the duel in such a way that people actually, in the marginal gentry, they actually prefer to duel. Or they prefer to invest, and therefore they're going to end up dueling. And finally, there are going to be people that are born in the bottom. Right? They're born in the gutter. Their, their social capital is so low when they're born that there's just no way in the world they could ever invest enough to become an aristocrat. And we don't want those people dueling. I mean, they shouldn't duel anyway, but I mean, maybe they're just good at dueling or they want to settle a grudge or they just like it. Or who knows what their ideas are? But we don't want them dueling. They're just noise in the system. So we're going to have to like, stop them from dueling somehow, right? Likewise, at the very top, we don't want the king dueling. We know he's trustworthy, right? So he's not allowed to duel either. We're going to, the prediction, if this is a test, then only this small band of people should be allowed to duel. We're going to design it so that it's hard to fake. We don't want fake duels around, just like a professor doesn't want to give a fake exam. That wouldn't be any point. We want it to be easy to verify. We want people to know that it actually took place. We want it to be unenjoyable for itself. We don't want you know, sickos just dueling because it's kind of enjoyable. We don't want that to happen. We want it to be a legitimate test. You might be thinking to yourself, this dueling sounds pretty good. I wonder, maybe we should introduce it back again. Maybe what we need in, you know, that's the way we should get a degree from the University of Calgary. Just, we duel with the professor, right? <laughs> Dueling's got some problems. I mean, one, it only works in this small patronage system, right, where you can't have 60,000 people in your, in your civil administration and, and have a system based on trust. That's not going to work. It often results in death or injury, so, you know, maybe that's a loss of human capital we don't like. Uh, it creates an incentive for investing in dueling skills, and that's bad, too. A, it's a wasteful energy, right? And also, it, it distorts the duel. We don't want good duelists. That's the biggest reason why you end up with pistol duels, is because you couldn't train with pistols. You could train with swords. And finally, you know, you're always worried about the Mr. Wickhams. You're always worried about them cheating somehow, so you're going to have to monitor that. All right, that's the story. So this crazy behavior is a way of testing to see if people have invested in a sunk asset that's going to act as a guarantee for their behavior in a world where you can't monitor and you can't measure. That's the theory. Does it work? Does it explain anything? Let's start on limits of participation. So I've, I've kind of already talked about this. It was designed for the John Churchills. Kings were not allowed to duel. Dukes were not allowed to duel. Earls were not allowed to duel. If you see a movie and it's got a duke that's dueling, that didn't happen. Or if it did happen, it would have been a major scandal. And in fact, the king or queen would have been involved. They had special courts of honor for the peers. Right? You got a dispute with a peer? A peer was not nice to you? Uh, that's fine, but you're going to court. We have a special court just for you, and you're not dueling. At the bottom, how do we keep the bottom ones out? We just make dueling illegal. We'll only enforce it for these bottom groups. You're commoner and you're dueling, that's attempted murder, right? And so you're out. So you've got this great irony that the lawmakers, the members of parliament, the aristocrats, the very fact, the people that were making the laws that it's illegal, 
are the ones who are dueling. So it looks like the ultimate act of hypocrisy. But in fact, that's the way it has to be if it's a screen. People like businessmen, they're not allowed to duel. They've got their own courts. They've got reputation mechanisms. They've got all kinds of ways of solving problems. The duel is not designed for them, and they are not allowed to duel, right? So it explains why some people are allowed to duel and others weren't. You can probably figure out this one. Why was the cause irrelevant, and why was the outcome irrelevant? The outcome is irrelevant because all we care is that you actually dueled. We don't care who won or lost. It's a test. If you duel, you're trustworthy. If you don't duel, you're not trustworthy. That's all we care. So we don't care what happens afterwards. Why are there all these limitless grounds? Because I want to make sure that you didn't fake a duel. Curtis and I actually just set up this whole business about him being cool towards me because he knew I was going to challenge him to a duel, then tomorrow we're going to have a fake duel. And everybody would think, oh, they're so trustworthy because they, they dueled, when in fact it was all just a, 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 a mirage. Well, they knew that. And so the way you avoid that is, oh, Doug's actually a duelist. He's actually one of these people competing for the king's attention. I think I'll duel with him as well. Remember, there's 15,000 of these people that are competing for the attention of the crown, and there's only a few offices. You start dueling, you attract duels, right? And so I might fake with Curtis, but the next duel is probably going to be a real one, and I'm a pretender. I'm going to get called, caught out. Why is reconciliation common? Why didn't Curtis give me the letter of apology first? Because that's what a pretender does. You have to demonstrate that you are trustworthy. And once we both duel, we both demonstrate that we're trustworthy, and now we're really our brothers. Beforehand, he uh, might be a pretender. You cannot apologize first. If, it's, if the economic theory is right, you cannot apologize first, and that's what happens. No change in social standing, again, because it's a, it's a test, it's a mechanism. When I duel, well, I'm trustworthy. Of course I'm going to go back to my appointment. Aaron Burr and, uh, and Alexander Hamilton, the most famous duel in history. Alexander Hamilton writes a letter to the editor under a pseudonym that the Vice President of the United States was not completely honest, didn't say he was lying, not completely honest in a political speech. Can you imagine a politician not being completely honest in a political speech? But Al Aaron Burr says, I know who wrote that letter. It was Alexander Hamilton. I challenge you to a duel. And the night before the duel, Alexander Hamilton writes a long letter of the thousand reasons why he should not enter this duel, including that his son was just killed in a duel with the very same pistols that they're about to use and which he is about to die with, right? <laughs> and, but at the very end of the letter, he says, however, I have political ambitions, right? He doesn't say he wants to be president of the United States, but he did. And he says, I, my, my career will be over. I will be an outcast if I do not duel. The next day, they duel. Aaron Burr shoots, kills Alexander Hamilton. And what does Aaron Burr do? Does he go on the lam? No. He goes back to the White House, finishes his day of work. Thomas Jefferson goes by. Hey, Aaron, how you doing? How's your day going? Oh, not too bad. I just killed Alexander Hamilton. Oh, no, no problem. Uh, you know, what, what are you going to have for dinner tonight? Uh, and that's the way it was. After, after he uh, finishes as vice president, uh, Jefferson gives him a commission to go explore the Louisiana Purchase. After he's done that, he goes back to New York, the home state of Alexander Hamilton, and finishes out a career as a lawyer. When he dies 25 years later, he gets uh, full rewards, honors, and et cetera. I guess I'm, I'm just about out of time. I get 10 minutes, I think. Is it 10 minutes I have? Let me just, I, okay, I'll, I'll kind of go. I want to show, I want to just, I'll focus in on this one. If the duel is a screen, it's essential that the, the, the probability of death is random. Because if it's not random, I can become a specialist at shooting and all the rest of it, and I can just go around challenging people because I'm a good duelist, not because I'm an investor. So they made it, uh, they made it random. How do they do that? Take the pistols. These were expensive, high-quality pistols. They knew how to make an accurate pistol, but these pistols were designed to be inaccurate. They made the barrel short, so when the ball, not the bullet, came out, it could go anywhere. They did not rifle the barrel, which was put that little spiral in the James Bond movies inside, which makes the bullet accurate. No, no, it was a smooth bore. They knew how to rifle, but they just didn't do it. No aiming beads. So you, there's no beads on it to aim. And the job of the second was to make sure there's no tree standing behind somebody either so that I can use that to line up, right? 
they'd have turn and fire rules. So I'm like this, turn, fire, boom. I'm not allowed to go like this. OK, move a little bit over there. I, I'm not allowed to do that, right? So they designed the duel so that the outcome was random. And that's what it had to be if the duel was a screen. Rule of seconds, the seconds were designed to prevent cheating. Right? They're just another reason for why cheating was not allowed. I'll skip that one. Just no patronage, no dueling. A couple interesting things is, you know, women were not allowed to have patronage appointments. Women were not allowed to duel. Jews were not allowed to have patronage appointments. Jews were not allowed to duel. Uh, anyway, I'll stop there. Economics is kind of powerful. It can explain lots of things. But uh, maybe if you have to go, you can go. But if, uh, uh, if you have questions, I guess we had five minutes, I guess. We have five minutes or so. Thank you.